I really think some really good things can come out of this where we can say, you know what, this is time. Uh, it's time to put this behind us to pull together, to love our neighbors despite our differences, whether whether those are political differences or religious differences or whatever you know they happen to be. Let's put those things aside because there are places that we can all come together uh, for the good of those around us. That, that would be good for not just uh, not just uh, our state and our nation. It'll be good for us personally too. It'll be good for our hearts. Good day, folks, and thank you for joining us on the public square and everything in it. Today, it's our pleasure to welcome North Carolina's Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest to the show. Lieutenant Governor uh, Forrest is the 34th Lieutenant Governor of the great state of North Carolina, and he served in this role since 2013. He's a Republican and is known throughout the state as a committed Christian. Lieutenant Governor Forrest, welcome to the show. Bruce, thanks for having me on. I appreciate uh, you allowing me to join you today. Yeah, so we've got a lot of interesting topics today, including uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and, and a number of other items. But I think, first of all, our viewers, I would like to hear a little bit about you. Uh, so, so if you could tell us about yourself, maybe your upbringing here in North Carolina, and especially how you came to know the Lord. Sure. Uh, well, I was raised in Charlotte. I uh, grew up there. We, I think we moved to Charlotte when I was one year old. So I'm basically a, a native uh, to North Carolina, over 50 years now in North Carolina. I call North Carolina my home. This is obviously where we've raised our kids, uh, but both my wife and I, we were both raised in the church. Uh, grew up going to church every Sunday, and for a lot of my life, uh, in all honesty and all fairness, uh, I don't remember really hearing the gospel. I never, at least it never impacted me or hit me in the right way. Um, so I grew up in what I would consider in today's terminology, kind of dead churches, if you will. Uh, and so um, it wasn't until much later in life that uh, my wife and I were uh, a part of this uh, program. These four older gentlemen started, they called it the Charlotte Leadership Forum. There were four older men that wanted to pour their lives into the, the younger generation and to give back in, in some way. So they started this group called Charlotte Leadership Forum. And it was primarily for Christian, uh, young Christian men. And it ended up becoming for, Christ for Christian couples. But my wife and I snuck in under the radar. We weren't believers at the time. And uh, we probably thought we were growing up in the church. But we um, really discovered how the Lord reached out and uh, in a thousand different miraculous ways that I would call God incidences, uh, brought people into our lives to uh, share Jesus with us in unique ways, including going to different churches and those types of things. And uh, I became a believer much later in life. I was almost 30 years old. And my wife was in her late 20s when we met the Lord. And then we had just the uh, just this great gift to uh, go through this sanctification process together over the last 20 some years and uh, and get to know Jesus in a better way. But uh, yeah, I mean, we've um, we have. Uh, a life of both sides, right? The life we, we call it before, our before Jesus days and our after Jesus days. Yeah, you know, um, so one of the aspects of your life story that I think uh, some North Carolinians might not know is that you're, uh, you're not a career politician. You don't smell like the swamp. And it reminds me of a quote by Richard Nixon. There are a lot of good quotes from him, but uh, he said uh, something to the effect of being president is like being a jackass in a hailstorm. There's nowhere to hide. You just have to, just have to stand there and take it. And I think, you know, being governor, you're running for governor and being lieutenant governors is probably similar. So why did you leave a very successful career as an architect and a business owner and expose yourself to, you know, the public and, uh, to, you know, a job that's not a comfortable job where, you know, you take uh, public office, you take some abuse, don't get a lot of gratitude, uh, don't make a lot of money. Uh, so what, what was it that triggered why would you do that? It, you know, right when you were hitting your stride with your career. Well, it, it was a calling. I know a lot of uh, people that are in politics say they're called to do it. But for me, um, it went down in a very short period of time where I very strongly uh, felt the Lord calling me to step out of my career in architecture, which I loved. I was a partner in just the best firm in the state. I loved the people I worked with. And like you said, I made good money. I, I got to do all the things I wanted to do, the kinds of projects I wanted to do. And I was having a great time. But God called me to something different. And it was such a strong calling that within a matter of just a few weeks, I left my entire career behind, my salary, my benefits, four grown kids, kids in college, uh, all these kinds of things. The world would say it was crazy. Uh, but that really is the, the difference between a calling and just a feeling, I think. You know, when you're called by God to go do something, 
no matter what the cost is, uh, you go out and you, and you do it. You, you don't really ask any questions, say, okay, God, here we go. Uh, what's next? And my wife was right there by my side to uh, walk through that with me and my kids were as well. And, you know, I grew up in a political family, so I, I knew what the consequences of this would be. Uh, I knew, uh, I, I knew about being a jackass in the hailstorm for sure. And so, uh, it, yeah, there are things that are really tough about it. And there are lots of arrows that you take and a lot of abuse that you take. But in the scheme of things, again, when God calls you to do something, you step out and do it and you get to witness um, God's favor along the way. And so you see all these doors opening and you just see these things happen along the way that you wouldn't witness otherwise. So uh, that's why we're here today. Yeah. So you mentioned that you um, grew up in a family. Uh, that that was uh, p- politically uh, involved. Uh, your mother was elected to office. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Any lessons you learned from her, watching her have to handle uh, this? She, you know, she was a mayor of Charlotte, first female mayor of Charlotte, uh, which uh, was quite a few years ago, and uh, back in the late '80s, and um, you know, tough time for women in politics. She was she was uh, you know kind of charting the way there. Uh, and then she served in Congress for uh, nine terms for 18 years. So um, I got to see a lot, actually. What I what I really learned from her was um, uh, that this is a public service job. You know, I remember answering the phone when I was uh, at home in Charlotte. She was mayor. Uh, I remember answering the phone and just people cussing you out on the phone. And this job, which was a part-time job, became a full-time job and just all kinds of abuse. And then I remember her watching her help people. And uh, what I, the, my story about my mom is I can travel all over North Carolina today. And she's been retired for a number of years now. But I can re- re- travel all over the state and people will tell me stories about how she helped them or their brother or cousin or mother or father, whatever it happens to be. And I say she's helped more people in the state of North Carolina, one person at a time than anybody else I know. Uh, her name's Sue Myrick, by the way. So people that are trying to figure out a last name or something, they won't get it. But um, so she represented people and she cared passionately about people. And uh, she was a true, the true essence of a public servant. And so, you know, that's, uh, we try to translate that into what we do today, that we're here to help people. You know, this isn't about Dan Forrest. It's certainly not going to be about making money. For me, it's not about uh, recognition or anything else I do. It's how do we help the most people in North Carolina by doing things that are right. And people will say, and I know you hear it too, Bruce, because you step out in this public square discussion with Christians. A lot of Christians will say, well, politics is ugly. I don't, I just don't do politics. And I hear it almost daily. And I say, well, that may be true, but good governance is a beautiful thing. And God created it. It's one of the institutions that God created. And as Christians, we do not get a free pass to step out of, of governance or politics. Yeah, you know, that's a great point. And uh, here on uh, the public square and everything in it, we do, uh, just like you said, affirm the political sphere as a sphere that is corrupted, of course, because it's sinners who are involved in it. But it's a, it's a sphere of life that's ordained by God. And it's a wonderful opportunity for Christians to step in and speak a good word in a bad moment. And I think we're in a bad moment in a lot of ways. Very toxic, kind of polarized public discourse, a lot of bad will on offer. And then on top of that, we're dealing with the plague. Uh, before we get to coronavirus, though, uh, just one question, a question on an, um, a matter that I know is uh, you're known for and that is uh, near and dear to my heart and those of us at uh, Southeastern Seminary where I teach and am dean of the faculty, and that is uh, the pro-life issue. You're known as uh, uh, an elected official who is willing to speak about this issue. A lot of people want to sweep it under the carpet or speak against it, but you're known as pro-life and, uh, to be more specific, is anti-abortion. So can you tell us why this issue matters so much to you? Well, I mean, how apropos for even the day and the times that we're, we're living in right now, where, you know, during the coronavirus epidemic or pandemic, everybody's talking about life and how precious every single life is. You know, you even have the governor of New York who came out and say, said, uh, if we lose just one life, that's too many. Uh-huh. But that's the same governor that lit up the city of New York pink when they passed the most egregious uh, abortion legislation ever saying you could kill a baby up to the very last second of his life. They were celebrating in New York uh, the loss of thousands and thousands of lives. So uh, while we know that uh, all life is precious and we believe that all life is sacred, uh, we need to remember the life of the unborn. I mean, how can we not remember that and think about that? 500 babies 
are killed by abortion in North Carolina every week, 500 a week right here. So, um, you know, nobody's speaking out for the, well, a few people are, there's a lot of people speaking out for those babies, but uh, not, a, not enough. And we have kind of brushed this under the rug and we act like it doesn't exist and that it's not a travesty in our country. But I, I'm convinced that at the right time, uh, you know, that if we do things well, uh, we love those women uh, who are facing these really uh, tough decisions they're trying to make. We, we love them in the right way. We let them know there's hope. We let them know there's opportunity for their baby and that there's going to be people there to help them and to get through those times, uh, that we will look back one day on abortion the same way we look back on slavery uh, as this massive travesty and, and uh, blemish on our, our nation one that's a blemish on the world too. We're gonna look back one day and go, how did we ever allow that to happen? Yeah, so I agree wholeheartedly. And for those of you who are out there uh, watching, I just wanna take a moment to say, you know, if you're a woman who's had an abortion, if you are a man who's pressured a woman to have abortion or paid for it, if you're a doctor who has terminated a baby, that there is uh, grace and mercy flowing from the throne of God, and, uh, and that is always on offer. But we also do want to say that uh, at the same time, uh, to make a firm statement about how bad abortion is, I want to mention for those of you listening there, if you're talking to somebody who's undecided about this issue or uh, who is pro-choice, um, you can use Christian line of reasoning, but there are also medical, legal, and sociological rationales. Christian line of reasoning is, the Bible teaches in Genesis chapter 1, that human beings are created in the image and likeness of God. So humans have a great dignity that we're like God. Um, you, know, you see in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, that says, thou shalt not shed blood unlawfully. Thou shalt not murder. And uh, who, who is uh, more of an innocent life, more of a weak and vulnerable life than an unborn baby? And so there's some distinctively Christian lines of reasoning that can lead you to share the gospel with somebody. But also, if somebody would like some other evidence, anytime the Bible teaches something, there's going to be evidence to back it up out there. Uh, so let me just give uh, really quickly a few lines of, of reasoning. You can show that abortion is bad for the baby, kills the baby. And you can remark that it's such an irony that an, uh, an unborn being in a womb in a hospital in North Carolina has far less legal protection than endangered species of bird in the forest outside of the hospital. Abortion is also bad for women because uh, it encourages men to be sexual predators. And men don't need that encouragement. This is an encouragement. This is why we have the Me Too movement, one of the reasons why. Uh, it's bad for families. It teaches families that if, if you encounter a problem bad enough, then you can use lethal violence to, uh, to solve it. It's bad for law-governed democracy because SCOTUS rammed it down our throats, invented a right that didn't exist, and shoved it into the Constitution. And there's a lot of other reasons. I'll just end with one more. It's bad for society as a whole. I'll quote Marianne Glendon, professor of law at uh, Harvard uh, University Law School said that Roe v. Wade was like uh, an environmental disaster on the moral ecology of our country, that it numbed our consciences, it taught us to go against our most basic moral intuitions to protect the weakest and most vulnerable among us. And so this is just a very important issue, and we need elected officials who, who have a backbone. There aren't many of those these days, a bunch of poll sniffers and tea leaf readers. And we need elected officials who are willing to stand strong uh, on issues, even if those issues are unpopular. So we're really uh, grateful for Lieutenant Governor Forrest. Speaking of pro-life, we're facing a pandemic and uh, just any advice you have for those of us in the state of North Carolina, people across the nation as we're facing uh, the plague, something we never really thought we would face. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, the, the biggest piece of advice is that uh, uh, we are facing you know, this uh, great dilemma once again in our culture uh, about freedom versus security. And if we want to be a free people, we have to be a responsible people, Bruce. Uh, we have to take personal responsibility for the things that are going on in our culture and uh, things that are going on in our, our homes and our communities and in our state and nation. So uh, first of all, our, what our leaders are telling us right now, our leaders that God placed uh, in, in uh, charge of us during this time, the President of the United States, the Governor of North Carolina, who I happen to be running against uh, for Governor right now. I mean, we're in a campaign against each other, but he's the man that God put in place to uh, bring good to us during this time. And so we need to listen to those leaders uh, and say what they say what's best is to uh, socially separate, to stay at home, to try to um, uh, you know, knock down this virus to, uh, to as few people as possible, as fast as possible. And so 
personal responsibility is really important. And we saw in the early days of this, people wanted to go out and do their own thing. Thousands of kids partying on the beach in Florida, uh, right next to elderly people who are the most susceptible to uh, getting this virus. So what you saw was a bunch of young people who didn't care about the elderly around them. And that's, that's horrible. But you know, especially as Christians, uh, we need to make sure that we are the ones that are uh, going an extra step above and beyond to protect and to care for those in need. So now that's the number one thing to do right now. The, the second thing is do not fear, do not worry. I mean, that's uh, clearly a biblical construct that, that we're not supposed to fear and worry. We're supposed to put our trust in God. And I can see that uh, there are great things going on right now. I think God's doing a great work, even during disaster and tragedy, which is where he often does a lot of, a lot of great things. And we'll look back and maybe be able to see some of those things. But, but as Christians, uh, not to worry and not to panic. I think one of the things that will, that will come out of this is that we will learn a lot of lessons from it. You know, we'll get better. Our nation will be stronger. Hopefully our church will be stronger uh, from it. But you look at, you know, there's a lot of churches. There's people that are kind of doing their own thing sometimes or saying people are still going to congregate. They're still going to meet. I'd say that's irresponsible as a church right now to do that. I, I think God is an amazingly creative God. And allow him to be innovative and creative. So from our perspective, Bruce, I think you and I could both look at this and see that probably, just probably, just maybe, I guess, the gospel may be spread, being spread around the world at an exponential rate right now because of the churches that have gone online and that have moved beyond the four walls of their church uh, to be able to share for the first time maybe with the world. So people all over the world can log into Facebook and other Zoom and other things and see the gospel presented in a new light. So you can you can dial up a church just about anywhere in America at any given time and, and see a gospel presentation from anywhere in the world. I think God's going to do amazing work through that. Uh, but he's doing that through the creativity that he's placed in men's minds and hearts to be able to spread that word, right? So our job, in my mind, is be, be personally responsible right now. Do what we need to do for a short period of time. Don't think about ourselves, but think about others. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, you make uh, two especially good points that I want to follow up on for our audience, just as a seminary guy and an elder at a church. Uh, and one is that God does bring good out of bad. I mean, you think of the early church, uh, uh, the plague swept through Rome twice in the early church. Uh, the emperors recognized that it was the Christians who were willing to look uh, death in the face and who stayed behind and cared for the sick. And it was a powerful testimony to our hope. And our hope is that Christ will return one day to set the world to rights and justice will roll down like the waters and we'll get to dwell with him forever. That's our great hope. And so hopefully we can look death in the face and be willing to care for our neighbors. And you know, the best example of God bringing good out of bad is the crucifixion. There's never a more evil event that happened in all of human history than the slaughter of the son of God. But out of it, uh, God brought a great good, and, and that's the gospel. And let me mention it. The gospel is this, that when Jesus stepped onto the cross, fully God in human flesh, he took our name, he offered to take our names upon himself, and that would be wicked one, sinner, and in response, offer us his name, which is righteous one. In other words, he offered to take our sins, die for them, take our punishment, uh, so that we can have everlasting life and have our sins forgiven. So we thank God for the, for the gospel. And yeah, second, you know, just, uh, just a couple points, you know, Bruce, related to that. I mean, think about what's going on right now, the points in history uh, where um, God quarantined his people. Well, one of those where it seemed, seemed, things seemed hopeless was the Passover. We got the Passover huh. from a quarantine. Uh, we also got the Pentecost from a quarantine, too, and God's spirit rushed uh, mm -hmm. uh, through his people. At that point, we saw exponential growth in the church yeah. during the time when his disciples uh, we're being quarantined. And here we sit, we just had Palm Sunday, uh, and now we're leading into uh, Easter uh, weekend and a time where, uh, just like today, when so many people think that so many things are hopeless, and a uh, time when even the disciples on that Friday uh, thought that all was lost, all hope was lost, and uh, Jesus was dead, and, and then you see the resurrection and, mm. and all the, the good for humanity that comes from that. You know, there's, there is light on the other side of this, and uh, God is a creative and uh, mighty, mighty uh, merciful and graceful God. You know, you just have to wonder uh, and hope and pray that God would bring, uh, number one, some unity in his church, um, among his people, some solidarity that we lock arms together as a witness for the Lord. And then it sounds like a long shot and I'm um, a little bit, you know, I tend to be cynical, 
But what if he could bring some national solidarity that we care about each other as Americans, we might disagree on political solutions and have some big arguments and, and that's fine, but for maybe some of the bad will could go away. Some of the just sort of bad will, you know, toward each other. I hope that'd be the case. Uh, back in August, I guess it was, we kicked off our campaign uh, for governor and uh, we, we laid out, a, our platform was based on three things, unity, opportunity, and possibility. But unity was that, that thing about bringing people together. I mean, obviously, we know that we live in one of the most politically divisive times in our nation's history, maybe not the most divisive, but certainly one of them. And we don't like that divisiveness. I mean, I think that a lot of it is uh, charged by the media. Uh, they fuel it and uh, they get it going, certainly social media, where people can hide behind fake names and say horrible things about people. Yep. And I think a lot of it is orchestrated uh, by political entities too behind the scenes that are, you know, people getting paid to say hateful things to, uh, you know, see this kind of discontent amongst people. So I don't think that's the American people. I certainly know it's not the people of North Carolina, the people that I'm around every day. They, they love their families. Uh, they love their neighborhoods, their neighbors, their communities. Uh, they love their city and state and they want what's best for the people around them. That's the North Carolina I know. And so I'm with you, Bruce. I really think some really good things can come out of this where we can say, you know what, this is time. Uh, it's time to put this behind us, to pull together, to love our neighbors despite our differences, whether, whether those are political differences or religious differences or whatever you know, they happen to be. Let's put those things aside because there are places that we can all come together uh, for the good of those around us. That, that would be good for not just, uh, not just uh, our state and our nation. It'll be good for us personally, too. Right. It'll be good for our hearts. You know, uh, two years ago, I uh, sort of got off of Twitter for the most part and for about two years. And I spent a lot more time talking to people face to face right here in Raleigh, people in the grocery store, people on the street. And Twitter is not the real world. And you know, talk everyday North Carolina people are good people. There's not a lot of bad will there. For those of you out watching, whether you're North Carolina or not, um, I just want to say that I think if the social fabric of our nation is going to be rewoven, it will not be at the national political level. It'll be at the state and the local level. So get involved, go to town hall meetings, uh, vote within your state, get out the vote for Dan Forrest. Uh, and uh, I just, uh, I think this could be a good moment for us as a state and as a, a nation. So we've only got a few minutes left, but I, I, there is one issue. I've heard you talk before about uh, having a victim mentality versus a responsible citizen mentality. I think this is um, pretty relevant. Can you talk about that for a moment in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, I mean, it's one of the frustrations that I have is, especially as you watch things in the media, is this kind of notion of people blaming each other. Where are they going to point blame? Are we going to point our fingers to China? Are we going to point our fingers to the president and the federal government, your local community? Do you point your fingers at the state? I think, uh, listen, we're not victims here. Yeah, we, we're an innovative nation. We're a creative nation. And uh, we need to be responsible. This is what I said at the beginning, this, this notion that we're always messing with here in this country of freedom versus uh, security. And at some point you give up all your freedom for security, there's no freedom left and, and you are a socialist or communist country overnight. That's bad for everybody at that point. But I just know that uh, for the young people that are watching, socialism does not equal social good. They are not the same things. In fact, they are on opposite ends of the spectrum. So uh, we need to be responsible for ourselves. So if you're a local community, you need to res be responsible for a pandemic or an epidemic or anything that comes along. If you're a state, you need to be responsible for yourself. We don't need to be looking to the federal government and say, when are we going to get our masks? When are we going to get our ventilators? When are we going to get our medicine? And if you're the federal government, we don't need to be looking to China and saying, when are we going to get our masks? How come you're not providing these things we need? We need to be able to take care of ourselves as Americans. We need to be able to take care of ourselves as North Carolinians. We need to be able to take care of ourselves, you and I here in the Raleigh area. Uh, and that goes all the way down to your home. You need to be able to take care of your family. You need to be able to take care of your friends. You know, when people were going through the world wars and, and so forth, they could take care of themselves. You know, they, they knew how to grow food. They had water stored up. They'd have things stored so that when bad things happen, they could get through it. And we're not like that anymore in America. And we need to get back to that. We're not victims. Uh, personal responsibility is, uh, needs to be uh, the mantra of the day. Yeah, back in the World War II era, that's what happened. We didn't look to China to help us uh, get the food that we needed. Americans got into action and built factories and, and uh, came together as a nation. And uh, this isn't a war right now, but it, it has some of the same feel. Uh, that we, it, we are being attacked, but by invisible pathogens. So, uh, Lieutenant Governor Forrest, thank you for joining us on the show. 
Uh, for those of you who are watching, thank you for joining us and we hope that you'll join us again soon on the public square and everything in it. Take care. Have a good day.